it's kind of up to you how well you do, right? And, and certainly you have to have great instructors, but you have to develop yourself over and over and over again. And you're competing at tournaments against other people, but you're really just competing against yourself. It's time for another great episode of Martial Arts Radio, the show that brings you amazing stories from the world's best martial artists. Today, we're talking to Sensei Katie Jordan as we bring you episode 136. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, but here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the web's best podcast on the traditional martial arts twice a week. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the host and founder of Whistlekick, makers of sparring gear and apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you checking us out for the very first time. Did you know all products ship for free from Whistlekick.com? Every single item you buy comes with free shipping, even exchanges. We want to be sure that you love your Whistlekick stuff, and free shipping makes it easier to love. Check out all the great things we offer today at Whistlekick.com. If you want the show notes, including links to everything we talk about today with Sensei Jordan, you can find those at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. If you're not on the newsletter list, it's time. We send out exclusive content, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. As a thank you for joining, we'll send you our top 10 tips for martial artists, an exclusive podcast episode. Sign up for the newsletter at any of the Whistlekick websites. I first met Sensei Katie Jordan in 2015 at a competition. Since that time, I've had the opportunity to watch her referee, see her compete a number of times, and otherwise just embody the martial arts. Sensei Jordan is a woman who has dedicated her life to her martial arts training, and that dedication shows easily. On today's episode, we hear about her deep love for the arts, her passion for her dojo, her instructor, and all of her martial arts friends, as well as all of the people she's met along the way. I hope you enjoy it. Sensei Jordan, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you uh, reaching out last week. Hey, I, I appreciate you accepting the invitation. Absolutely. Right. So I'm looking forward to getting to know you, you know, sat in a couple chairs near you and, and you were helpful at the, the 2016 martial arts showdown and just, you know, you've, you've been around. I mean, we've kind of, kind of done that planetary orbit thing around each yes. other for a couple of yes. years. Sat so, in a few rings together yeah. for sure. Yeah. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting to know you better. And of course, I'm sure the listeners will as well. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. Hey. How many can how many can we cross before it becomes bad luck? Yeah, right. <laughs> Let's start by giving everyone some context. You know, you're a martial artist, but how did you get started as a martial artist? Sure. So um, I had always kind of wanted to to try it when I was really young. So talking like six, seven years old, um, as a lot of kids do. And uh, I tried it out at a local rec center, um, and it really wasn't a a good fit. Um, and then one of my my best friends from elementary school was a uh, student under Shihan Andy Campbell um, in Scarborough, Maine. And he had a, a karate birthday party that I went to. Um, and that was before Shihan ever even had a dojo. He was just renting a room at a gym. Uh, and I went to the birthday party. And for anybody who knows Shihan Andy, he is like a giant kid. I mean, he's the most fun person you'll ever meet, right? So at seven years old, I met him and I thought, not only do I love karate just from this little, you know, one hour birthday party, but this is the coolest person I've ever met in my whole life ever. So, <laughs> uh, you know, he gave a little, uh, one week karate pass and, and my parents kind of did the thing of like, well, you know, is this just going to be another activity like, like dance and ballet and you know, that she'll kick off and be done with in a month or two. Um, so it gave me a little delay. And a couple months later, I finally got in for a class and, uh, did my intro class and I, I've been, I mean, I've been there ever since. I've been a student of his for um, 16, coming up 17 years this spring. Um, I do live down in Massachusetts now, so um, I'm training with the with the ICA organization at the time, and I'm, I'm teaching over at Harvard um, for their club, but still very much a student of his, and I mean, he's like family now. So um, yeah, I never took a break, and, and I've been there the whole time, and I teach a little now, but I certainly still train. Um, I've been competing for of that 16 years, probably 14 or 15. Um, so I'd say that's my, I'd say that's my background as of right now. Yeah. I got my black belt back in 2000. I'm going to draw a blank here. 2006, 2005. Okay. It's one or the other. <laughs> Before Facebook was around, so I don't even get the reminders anymore. 
It's, it's all a, good. No, no, nobody's going to dig in and say, you know, you, you don't deserve your black belt because you forgot the year that you, had, that you got it. Well, I mean, <laughs> someone somewhere will probably say that, but I won't I'm be sure, that person. You know. <laughs> and of course, you referenced Shion Andy, who's been on the show all yes. the way back at episode yes. nine. Wow. And you're yeah. what? For, are you up over 100 now? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're, you're going to be in the 130s, 140s. Wow. So, yes. there, so we, he, we've done a few episodes, but yeah, for anybody that, that knows Shihan Andy or, or listen to that episode or, or, you know, maybe go listen to it again. He is a big kid. It's a great way to describe it. And uh, I've got a feeling as we move forward that some of your stories are going to revolve around the way he set you up to learn martial arts and oh, your absolutely. attitude towards it because yep. of that fun. I mean, one of the things I always say is that kids will not, the kids will refuse to learn anything if they're not having fun. Oh, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Um, and you know, and he still brings the learning in absolutely. Um, it, it, and produces some good students, but there's something to be said for, for a guy who produces a program where kids come into the dojo with a smile on their face and they come out the same way. And that's what keeps them coming back. Or at least that's what kept me coming back. Um, I looked forward to seeing him and, and the other instructors too. I mean, we have a great team there, but, um, I look forward to being in the dojo every day from the time I'm seven years old through the high school years. And, and now when I'm home on for holidays and that kind of thing, I, he's still my favorite person, you know, and, and that's really what turns somebody from just another coach, just another instructor to somebody that, you know, is, is that invited to family events and we travel to Europe together and all that kind of stuff. And, um, that kind of connection is really what, what keeps people around in my opinion. Hey, and I agree with you, and I bet most people out there would agree as well. Certainly. So what was it – I mean, it must have been more than just your relationship to him and, and the way he presented the information because, you know, he, you you could have a, a really fun person bring you into a ditch-digging class, and you're probably <laughs> not going to stick around, right? So there's more to your time in the martial arts and your dedication to the martial arts than your instructors. Absolutely. What was yeah. it about your training – that clicked for you? Cause I, I think you said something about your parents were hesitant because you weren't sticking with other things. Did I, did I catch that right? Yeah. I mean, I had, I had done dance and ballet and, you know, kind of the activities you, you put six year olds in. Um, and it just never really, it just never really stuck. It wasn't my thing. I was definitely a tomboy when I was younger. Um, and I was a, we're a pretty big sports family. So, um, and I did play other sports growing up through softball and volleyball and that kind of thing. But, um, I, it was just, I think because karate is, a, and I say this loosely, but a singular sport in the sense that it's kind of up to you how well you do. Right. And, and certainly you have to have great instructors, but you have to develop yourself over and over and over again. And you're competing at tournaments against other people, but you're really just competing against yourself. Um, and I think having a sport where you can just, I mean, you get out of it what you put into it, which is like with a lot of things, but um, I think having a sport where it's, very individual um, based is huge. And that's really what I liked. And I think that's kind of what engaged me. Um, and I just found the sport so different and it was such a unique thing. And, you know, I had classmates from school that came in and out and maybe did six months, maybe did a year, maybe less, maybe more, but um, it was always something that kind of set me apart too. And I liked having that whole separate karate life. You know, I liked having my karate friends um, and peers, but I liked having that thing that kind of set me apart and that wasn't really tainted by anything else. You know, it was very personal um, to me. I, there's nobody else in my family that does it. Um, none of my friends do it anymore, but it was something that I just loved being able to work on by myself and with my instructors. And it was like its whole separate uh, uh, aspect of my life. And that's what I really liked about it. And that's still what I like about it. Um, and there's so much to learn and it's so different all the time. You know, it's softball, volleyball, it's the same game every time. Right. But the depth of what you can learn in the martial arts is just, I mean, I'm 16 years in and I feel like I've barely skimmed the surface, you know, which I'm sure you'll agree. And that goes for any style, but yeah. there's so much to learn. The, whenever you we have a sport like that, I think it's just, I think it's fascinating. I think it's fantastic. And uh, my interest in the martial arts have evolved too. So I think that that's what has kind of sparked it along as well. You hit on something that really has always resonated 
for me and, and people that follow whistle kick on social media may have seen this quote come out. Martial arts is one of those rare pursuits where you get back exactly and only what you put in. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I think for a lot of people that maybe don't find their place elsewhere. And, and that's me. I'm not saying that's you, but that was, absolutely was me. Martial arts was the place where I knew if I worked harder, I got more. Right. And there was nothing else in my life at that time as a kid where I had that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, you know, like I said, I, I played other sports and, and I think it's the same thing. You know, if you um, work a lot harder than your teammates at, at whatever, you're going to turn out um, to be a better player. But I think the thing about, you know, there's something that feels so great about starting your first class and when you when you line up and you bow in and you're all the way at the end because you're the white belt and you're the new one. And then all of a sudden, you continue to go to class more than everybody else does and you work harder than everybody else does. Um, and then all of a sudden, you move up that line. And the next thing you know, you're standing next to the head instructor with a black belt around your waist. And there's something that feels really good about that. Um, and uh, And then to move on further from that, to be able to pass on knowledge now um, as an instructor is I, I've really been surprised how great it feels. I knew I would like it. I mean, I, you know, I'm outgoing. I like to teach. I like to work with the kids and the adults and surprisingly, sometimes even the teens depends the day, but <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Um, but being able to, to pass that on, there's not a lot of other sports where you, you can really become a, I mean, you know, it's not that common to become a coach in many other sports, but, um, I love finding other kids with that same passion that I had at seven years old, 10 years old, 13, you know, 18, whatever the case may be. Um, and you have an instant connection and it's something that you can pass on to them that is so valuable to you and you can tell when it's so valuable to them. Um, and that's, that's a, that's a relationship that's so meaningful, um, that it's just, it's so different and it's not something that you really get in many other activities or many other programs or, or ways of life or whatever you want to call it. Um, and I think that that's really what is another thing that's been setting it apart for me within the past, oh, I don't know, five or so years. Absolutely. Now, I know you've listened to the show and you know how big stories are as we talk about the martial arts journey and, and learn about people. And I'm sure you've got some good stories. So why don't you take a minute? Tell us your best martial arts story. There's a lot to choose from, I got to say. Um, that's good. I would say my... <laughs> I would say my favorite ones were probably the trips that I got to take um, overseas um, for the Wilma uh, World Marshall Games. I went with uh, Sheehan and Andy all four years, and then um, two years my mom went. One year my dad I got to take. He'd never been to Europe before, actually, so that was cool. Um, and I got to take my mom back to Ireland, so you know, take her back to the homeland. Um, and then one year I went by myself uh, with Sheehan and Andy and, and with the team. And it's it's just the best it was the best times because for anybody who's a huge karate nerd like me, I mean, you love the competition and the training as it is, but you spend two weeks with people who become really close friends to you. And then, you know, you compete for three days and you take a day before, um, to work out with the team and to train. And then the week after you just tour around, uh, the UK and you go see castles and you go to these medieval dinners. And then if you're traveling with Shihan Andy, he's usually dancing or singing in public loudly climbing, th you know, whatever. I mean, he's, he's under just the most hilarious person ever. Um, yes. I saw him climb a castle once when we were in Wales. Um, I mean, we, we did, um, uh, and, oh gosh, I'm going to forget the name, the, like the underground tunnels in Edinburgh, Scotland that are supposedly haunted. I mean, we did those. Um, I totally just screamed like a little girl. Um, <laughs> And, uh, just the, the stuff we got to see were there for the, the Scottish tattoo festival, which is like a big military bagpipe festival. I mean, that stuff's awesome. And, um, you just get to, to see things and do things that you never would otherwise. And you make friends with people from other countries. And those are just times that I'll always, you know, really cherish. Um, especially getting to take my parents with me too, um, is, is, you know, special memories that, that you'll hold on to. But, um, I would say those trips over there are hilarious. And being that I was what 16 to 20 when I was going, um, 
I could kind of hang out with the adults, but it was a lot of fun because they still kind of like give you the crap of being the younger black belt and younger teammate in the group of adults that you are. So, right. oh God, they would make me just eat the craziest like octopus head. And I don't even, I can't even talk about it. <laughs> I think I'll get sick, but they make you eat crazy stuff and do crazy stuff. And it's, you know, it's like very friendly, good natured hazing yeah. for four summers in a row. And, <laughs> you know, and that was, and, and it was a blast and we had a great time and you meet some wonderful people. Um, I would say those are, those are the best times. We just laugh straight for two weeks. And if anybody has an opportunity to go, whether it be the Woma circuit or, or anything else where you can travel, um, do it seriously. You will have the best time. Obviously it's more fun if you win <laughs> by all means, but, um, even if you don't, I mean, just going for the trip, some of my favorite memories of all time are, are from karate road trips or trips overseas or wherever they may be. Um, I think martial arts has the best people in the world. Honestly, I really do. I agree. So, we, uh, we've talked yeah. about that on the show. Yep. Yeah. Martial artists are a great group of people. Without yes. a doubt. And it, you know, I'm wondering now because I know there are some people listening that are in charge of rank testing and, and promotions and such. And I know a few that like to do some kind of weird, creative, borderline mean things, especially <laughs> after the physical component. And I'm wondering if eating octopus head is going to enter into anybody's <laughs> testing now, because I know some stuff that's not far off that people have had to do. So I've heard some, a few crazy some... stories. Yeah. As far as the actual tests go, I mean, you know, we keep things pretty straightforward, but uh, when I always, I always joke with them. I say what Shihan does student or what Shihan says student does. Right. So if you want to tell me to eat cow and octopus head and frog legs was the other one he made me eat dipped in hot sauce you know what i'm the student and if you ask me to do it yes sir fine i will yes sensei i agree mm. so uh <laughs> it's you know it's all in good fun obviously but uh right. it's a good time of course he's a blast so obviously martial arts is a huge part of your life but i'm sure there are some parts of your life that aren't martial arts i mean they may be small but mm -hmm. when you're not training or teaching you know what do you like to do um i do like to travel uh i haven't been able to do it a ton lately a little bit but uh my junior year of college so it was the spring semester was 2015 uh, i got to study abroad for a semester so i lived in florence italy for uh the spring semester and i got to travel to i want to say eight or nine countries who did all over italy of course and interlaken and Switzerland and we went over to Ireland for St. Patrick's Day and uh we did Greece and all that kind of stuff. So I love to travel and uh you know, working full time, you don't get to do it quite as much, but I do have a big tri uh, trip planned out west to go do um Arizona, New Mexico and Antelope Canyon. Um when I was down in the Bahamas this spring. So with a whole bunch of friends. I really like to travel. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to go ski out west. That's that's next on my bucket list. All right. Well, of course, there are places to train wherever you go. And I think that that's one of the fun things. I, I wish more people sought out places to train when they traveled. You know, it's, I agree. It's not, it's not something that we're terribly organized about. But, you know, a, a lot of people listening know that in addition to martial arts, one of my passions is CrossFit. And that's something that happens in CrossFit all the time. You, you go traveling somewhere, you actually seek out a CrossFit gym. And I... One of my hopes is that, you know, we'll look back in 10, 20 years and we'll see something similar in the culture of martial arts because we're all better when we share. I agree. I agree. Um, I, uh, I was fortunate enough to, to train in Florence when I lived there. There was um, a gentleman who was a black belt under, um, under the JKA, I believe, but he trained with, with one of the instructors in the ICO organization. And he, his instructor back in Italy happened to live maybe half a mile from where my apartment was. So cool about once a week, I was able to go train over there. And that's kind of, it's sort of poetic. And it's kind of beautiful that, you know, obviously, I, my Italian was horrible. I really <laughs> could I live there for four months, my Italian was just heinous. But, you know, you can walk into a dojo and him and I can't really conversate that well, because we obviously speak different languages. But, you know, I'm in my gi and I bow in and uh, the techniques are called out in Japanese, so I could pick those up. And, um, you know, you just, 
he says something, calls out a kata, and all of a sudden, I have no idea what's going on otherwise, but you all train together, and you all do kata together, and you're all, you know, it's it's a universal language. It's kind of, I don't know, maybe that's corny, maybe it's tacky, but I found it to be kind of poetic. So I thought that was really nice. And, and uh, totally give him uh, huge props for letting me come in and, and train with them, um, because he was a fantastic instructor. So awesome. that was very cool. I don't think that's corny at all. I think that, I think that's awesome. And I think that, you know, we need more things to, oh, this is going to sound corny to bring us together right? I agree. as, as people. And, and, you know, I think as martial artists, we tend to take for granted how easily we can get along with each other. I couldn't you agree know, more. You know, and, and yep. especially people that are willing to, to travel out, you know, I mean, the, the people that don't want to interact are going to stay within their own school, but mm -hmm. those that go to tournaments or, or, you know, travel to seminars or whatever, you tend to meet some amazing people. And, you know, we've talked a lot about that on this show and, and just another plug to anybody listening, you know, get out of your own training environment if you can and, and experience things from other people and just, you know, build yourself as a, as a martial artist, add some diversity. I couldn't agree more. I really couldn't. I, I think that I give a lot of props to instructors who will bring in other people um, to do seminars or classes or whatever the case may be. I, I, I know some think that maybe that discredits them and I don't agree at all. I think that the more you can educate yourself as a martial artist and the more you can educate your students, the more, the better things are going to turn out and your students are going to stay loyal if you're, you know, creating a good relationship with them and, and, um, and training them well. And, I, uh, I really appreciate it when instructors will do that. I just did a seminar, uh, two weekends ago with Sensei Clay Morton, who is an ISKF guy and, uh, outstanding kata practitioner. Just, I mean, one of those people that just blows your mind when you watch him perform. Mm, nice. Um, and, uh, yeah. And, and the, the ICA organization brought him in and he, it was great, you know, and you just, everybody has something they can bring to the table. And, uh, I really appreciate it when, when schools will do that because, you know, the more you can learn, the better. Nice. Now, you've done martial arts effectively your whole life. I mean, pretty much the whole thing. Sure. At some point, something happened. You went through a rough patch. And I'm sure that you leaned on your martial arts experience to get through it. Totally. Think about it. Tell us what it is. Tell us how you got past it. Cool. Yeah. Um, I, I find martial arts to be the ultimate outlet and the ultimate distraction. I mean, distraction in the, in the best terms. Um, I always have turned to it and I've been pretty fortunate. I mean, I've, I've, you know, haven't run into any, anything crazy. I know some people have had these horribly traumatic uh, life experiences that I've, I've listened to in your interviews or been just brutally bullied. And I was fortunate to not have anything that bad, but when things do come along, um, I find that turning to martial arts and especially the people there, um, which, you know, we've mentioned several times has just been the best outlet. Um, I remember my sophomore year of high school, um, my grandpa who I was really close with, uh, passed away unexpectedly, very suddenly. And, um, we, uh, had the funeral on a Friday and then Friday afternoon, Friday morning and Friday afternoon, um, was the burial. And in 10 minutes after the burial, I was in the car with my mom on the way to a tournament. Um, and some people might hear that initially and say, well, that's kind of insensitive, but it's not. That's what I personally have to do. And I, and my, you know, my mom totally understood that. Um, and so did, so did my dad's side of the family, that that's, that's what you have to do. And it's hard to sometimes I think understand for people who aren't as deep into the martial arts as somebody like you or I is lucky enough to be, but there's something about getting away from it and there's nothing else that you can focus on when you're doing kata or when you're especially fighting, you can't really think about much else when there's a kick coming at your head. Right. But, um, there's something that's like, it's the ultimate escape. And even like when I was abroad, uh, my first little bit there, I was brutally homesick. Right. And I remember literally saying like, I just need to go cause I hadn't connected with the dojo yet. So I need to go do karate somewhere. And I literally, I walked out of the, the hostel we were at and I found a field and I just did kata for like an hour and I got a lot of weird looks. That's fine. Whatever. But, um, it, it's just the ultimate outlet. It's the ultimate escape. Um, and for anybody who hasn't 
I don't, I mean, I'm assuming most of your listeners are martial artists, but anybody who hasn't done it, I encourage you to do it. And for people who are, um, in deep, like, like I am, I certainly think, you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's just something that once you walk on the dojo floor or wherever you're training, everything else doesn't matter for an hour or two hours or three hours, however long you're there. Um, you just leave it at the door. And I don't find that to be the same for when, like I go to the gym, you know, if you're running on a treadmill, you know, get your endorphins going, that's fine. But you still kind of carry the day's problems or whatever the case may be with you. But I find that there's something so peaceful. You can just really clear your mind. Um, for me, that especially happens with kata. And uh, it's keeps your stre- it keeps my stress level down. It's, it's just, I, I can't really picture what my life would be like without it. I think it would be very confusing and more stressful and more problematic. Um, but it's just the ultimate escape. And that's the, I think that's the best way to put it. It really can turn your day and your week around. Um, so I would say that's probably the best, the, the best thing to do for me whenever I run into anything, um, that, that causes some hard times is I literally just leave the situation and I just go train. And for that two or three hours, nothing else matters. Right on. So I know you've had a lot of influential martial artists around you, you know, people that have had a tremendous impact on your life. And I I know who quite a number of them are. You do. Yes. (laughs) I want to take, I'm going to ask you this next question and I want to take Sheehan Andy out of the mix. Okay. Who has been the most influential person on your martial arts? Uh, I would say Sheehan Wayne Mello and all of his instructors. Um, who I believe we've interviewed before, uh, obviously pretty episode well known. Six. Episode six. There you go. And a wonderful guy. Yes. Um, I first met him when I was seven years old and we were doing our first tournament. It was the uh, Pine Tree State Championships right out in Freeport and had never done one before. Totally was in over my head. You know, my mom had never seen one before. And I, he walked right over and said, hey, you guys look a little lost. You know, let me let me help you out. And he did, and, and the tournament went fine, and had it gone horribly, I don't know if I would have competed again. So I give him a lot of credit to that. But even more so, um, when I moved down to Waltham, Massachusetts, to go to school uh, five years ago, I wanted a place to train. And him and his instructors um, that I – so I would sometimes train under him before he retired. And then also Sensei uh, Rich Borges – and Sensei Mike Dumas, and um, uh, I know you know uh, Sensei DJ Oleski and Sensei Donnie, and mm-hmm. all of their uh, schools and instructors with the ICO organization have just welcomed me with open arms. And not only have I learned a lot from them, but what I really appreciate the most is what a great uh, relationship that not only they have with me, but that they have with Shihan Andy, and that it's very much, it's not, you have to do things our way, and you have to do this, and and, and have to do that. Um, he, you know, correct the things that are wrong. Absolutely. But they very much respect the foundation and everything that she on Andy has taught me. And I think that that's huge. Um, there are a lot of instructors that will say you have to do it my way and it turns into an ego thing and it hasn't been that way at all. Um, they've welcomed me with open arms and I go to the events and the fundraisers and, you know, out to dinner after advanced trainings with them and that kind of thing. And they've taken me in like one of their own and, whether or not I continue to live in Massachusetts or I move back to Maine, I mean, time will tell. But he's very much, you know, if you want to stay with us, stay with us. If you want to go back to Sheehan Andy, I mean, you know, I know that's where your your ultimate loyalty lies. And he's just been the best mentor and the best instructor. Um, and I, I can't thank him enough. Um, and I probably don't thank him enough to to for what for what he's done for me and for just letting me learn and just letting me come work with them and come be friends with them. And they really are the epitome of a martial arts family to and through every one of their schools is wonderful. Um, and they've taken me in like one of their own. And I just am so eternally grateful to all of them. And there's, I can't think of a way I could ever pay them back. Um, so he's been a huge influence and, uh, for anybody who knows him, I I think that they can find this very easy to believe. Sure. And, you know, as I said, we, we did have him on the show early on. He was the first, if I remember correctly, the first karate practitioner we had on as a guest because early on I was grabbing people that I knew would would say yes and, and would uh, go easy on me. <laughs> getting started, they were, they were all Taekwondo people right around me. So uh, 
the first karate person I brought on was was Shihan Wayne because when I went to college, I went to college in Worcester, Mass, in part okay. to train with him. So I, I, I know literally exactly what you're talking about because I experienced it. Yeah. You know, yeah. A, a few years ago myself. He, he's a good person. And uh, just one, one thing that might help the listeners understand something you're referencing um, both Shihan Andy and, and, and the ICA organization are Shotokan karate. Yes. You know, so we're yes. talking about the same style, but of course, as anybody who has done any kind of training in another school knows, there's always things that are done a little bit differently. Yeah. And quite often, that's a place where martial artists let their ego come through. No, this is the right way. And right. So I just wanted to put that out there because I think that underscores a lot of what you're what you're talking about and a lot of that praise. Definitely. Definitely. Yep. He's uh he's they've all been him and all his instructors have just been totally respectful of, you know, not uh imposing too much on on the foundation that Shihan Andy laid when I was back in Maine. And um and they're all good friends too anyway. So I think if he could choose anywhere that I would train um while I'm living down here in Massachusetts, they would they're right on the top of his list. So that's worked out really well. Sure. Let's talk about competition. Now, other than the fact that, you know, maybe without Shion Mello, you would have not gone to any more competitions. And, you know, maybe we would have lost you from the martial arts entirely. <laughs> <laughs> well, never I'm not being that. dramatic, but... You, no, you know. no, I that that's fair. <laughs> Could have happened, right? Could have. Let's talk about your relationship with competition. I mean, we, we've heard that it's something that you enjoy, but let's talk about, let's talk about the why. You know, what is it about competing that resonates for you that you've done it for almost your entire martial arts career i yeah yeah and i have um and i'm i'm really active on the opponent circuit um what it is for me it's uh in part the people which you know time and time again i feel it comes up but it's just one of those truths um but i just i love having competition where you rely on nobody but yourself. And it's not that I don't appreciate team competition because I did team sports coming up and, and there's something to be said for those. Those are a blast. But um, where I can go in and if I take first place or I don't place at all, to, I know what I have to work on and it comes down to just myself. And um, you can go up to one of the judges and ask for respectful feedback and whatever you get from them you take it home and you work on it and you see how you fare next time. And it's just a never ending process of figuring out how to better yourself. Um, and I love that. And, uh, you know, I have a, I certainly have a competitive edge, so that's always fun. And, uh, you know, when you get into the ring to, to spar or when you get into grands or something like that, that adrenaline, um, kicks in a little bit and that's always, that's always really fun. Um, but I would say, I would say just the opportunity to, I, I truly think, when you compete, you become a better martial artist. That's not to say people who don't stink, because that's not what I'm saying. It all comes back to what you're doing in the dojo. But I really think competition makes people better. You see different fighters. You see different styles. You see what works for people or what doesn't. Um, you meet a lot of great martial artists who can give you uh, different types of feedback. Um, and you really create a network of people who do the same thing. And I think that's what's what's really kept me around. And I just... I enjoy it. You know, you walk into a tournament, you know, a lot of the people by now and, um, a lot of them have become really close friends, uh, over the years. And then to have that common bond where you're all black belts or all martial artists or, or underbelts too. Uh, I think that's what keeps me around. I mean, I've really never had that many tournaments that I didn't enjoy. I just love, I love being there. I love seeing the students compete. Um, I love the competition and it just, it just is something that I don't think I could ever really give up. It's a kind of a lifestyle, I suppose. Have you competed in anything that isn't martial arts? Uh, other sports? Yeah. You mean? Yeah. I played varsity softball and volleyball um, in high school and uh, had some great times. I loved it. But um, at the end of the day, you know, I, I, I love being on the softball field, but I, you know, I always keep my eye on the dojo. It's always kind of where I want it to be. But uh, different different kind of different training for it. Comp uh, the games go differently. You know, you rely on your teammates. Um, and that can either be great if you're having a crappy day and they can pull you up. Or you can be having an all-star day and the rest of your teammates just kind of aren't pulling their weight. 
Um, and that stinks too. And that's kind of, you know, six in one half dozen in the other, but martial arts is, um, you know, like I said, it being a singular sport, it's, it's all very individualistic and I have a huge appreciation for that. Sure. If you could train with anybody that you haven't and they can be alive, they can be dead anywhere in the world, who would you want to train with? Uh, dead. I would, uh, I mean, I'd say master Funakoshi. I, I don't think you can really, as far as us karate practitioners go, there's really nobody else that comes to mind. I mean, he's, you know, the, the father of modern day Shotokan karate. And that's, that's about as great as you can get. Um, so that would be fantastic living. I think I would go way out of the Shotokan element. I think I would do somebody who's way, you know, off the Shotokan map. Like I would take, um, I would take like a, a Holly Holmes or Ronda Rousey and they would totally kick my butt and I would just get destroyed on the mat. But you know, let them kick me around for a couple hours. I don't care. <laughs> Throw me on the mats, whatever. I would do something very, just very random. You know, somebody not in the karate realm, just to experience a different style, a master of a different style, and just let them, I don't care, kick my butt, throw me on the mats, flip me on my head, but, you know, do your thing. Now, <laughs> are you picking those names because you, you admire the two of them, or is there, is there, am I reading something in about you going completely 180, you know, wholly different than traditional karate, like, you know, would, or, or is it both? Um, I mean, I do, I certainly respect them as, you know, masters of their craft. I mean, Holmes is a great boxer and, and Rousey had the whole judo thing going before any, any MMA, but I do have a lot of respect for what they have done for women in combat sports. And that's not to discredit any other top female athletes in karate or taekwondo or kung fu or whatever the case may be. But I mean, they are the ones who are the most heavily exposed, obviously. I mean, they're, you know, worldwide uh, known worldwide for a reason. So that's just kind of the reason I would go for them. Um, I really appreciate what they have done for advancing women in the martial arts and not making it such a taboo um, and uh, not making it such a, a bad thing in society's view to be a physically jacked woman who can, you know, take care of herself and, and throw down a little bit. I think that's great. Um, and, uh, I, I hope that that the popularity of, of that, of women in, in combat sports continues. Cause I'd love to see more girls in the dojo, whatever the, the style may be. I, I just have a lot of appreciation for the, uh, I guess, it would, I guess I would say the, I don't even know what the word would be. I don't know. Maybe cut that part out a little, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> just, just the respect I think that they've brought for women in the martial arts from a broad spectrum within the martial arts. I, I think there's plenty of respect for women, but, um, you know, for, for people that maybe aren't as involved, I think yeah. there's something to be said for what they've done. And I, I have an appreciation for it. Sure. I, I, I know what you're saying and, and, you know, whether or not you felt you picked the right words, I completely understood. You know, when we think of prominent women in traditional martial arts, I mean, the one that, that comes to mind the most is Riku Usami. Oh, absolutely. And, right. And and if anyone has oh, seen... Shoot. Can I change my answer? I would choose her. <laughs> you want to choose oh, her? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for anyone that, that doesn't know who Riku Usami is, she's a very much shared on social media, traditional karate practitioner uh, from Japan, and just does a beautiful kata. And yes. Someone that is, is held up in a very high regard. Now, it doesn't matter how many times we share her doing, you know, Goju Shiho or, or, or any traditional kata, people outside of the traditional martial arts world are never going to know her name, at least with the current martial arts landscape. But yep. someone like Ronda I Rousey has fans, like legitimate fans from all walks of life across the globe that train and, and do not. Right. And so if we, we talk about who is doing more to validate, and it, it, it's kind of gross that you know that word is even appropriate women's participation in martial arts in combat sports you know ronda rousey is doing infinitely more she is yeah and it, i now that you said it i wish i had thought of usami because i would have chosen her in a heartbeat i totally just brain cramped on that one but <clears throat> yeah you're totally right and i i agree i don't think that that discredits 
uh, Usami or, or um, any of the top karate practitioners out there, um, but, or for any style. Sure. But you're right. I mean, they just, the bottom line is, is they have the exposure. That's all it really comes down to. Um, and people love to see that p- other people fight. Non-martial arts practitioners don't always really understand kata. So like you said, it's not going to become as popular. I know how many times it's shared on Facebook by martial artists. But um, yeah, I, I, I really appreciate what they've done. And um, you're getting a lot of young girls and women who have always kind of said like, oh, I've never thought of doing any type of martial arts or learning any type of even just self-defense until these big names, even, even before her, like Gina Carano um, and that kind of era coming out and becoming so famous and, uh, you know, kicking ass. And, uh, I think that's great. I mean, I have friends, younger siblings who would have never thought to ever get into any type of, uh, uh, martial arts or no matter the type. And all of a sudden they're like, Hey, yeah, you know, I want to try that. That looks great. And I, you know, you gotta be kind of grateful for, to them for that. Yeah, I agree. And of course, I'll drop a video into the show notes for your episode over on the website for anybody that might be new. Um, video of, of Riku Sami doing kata. I'm sorry, my thoughts ran away. Uh, Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. So anybody that hasn't seen uh, the magic that is her performing, you can check that out. Oh, yes. Magic indeed, for sure. Let's talk about movies. Are you a fan of martial arts movies? <laughs> That's probably where my whole interview is going to get discredited. Really? I oh, okay. Actually, and and I just get oh, I get ripped on for this. All in good fun, but I get ripped on for this. I'm not a fan of martial arts movies. I don't hate them, but I just I I'll never choose to. They're just not my thing. Um, I can appreciate the people in them and their training, and you know Jackie Chan and Jet Li and all Bruce Lee and all those kind of guys. Um, but I will choose a chick flick over a martial arts movie Monday to Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And I've had people be like, Oh God, give me your black belt card right now. That should just be, you're just, that's just so sad. But you know what? I am unapologetic about it. I will go to the dojo and martial arts is my life. And I will, I will be in it for the rest of my life. But when I come home at the end of the day, am I watching enter the dragon or am I watching legally blonde, legally blonde, 10 out of 10. (laughs) No question. <laughs> now, I, I'm laughing because I, I'm surprised, not so much that you're, you're not a fan of, of martial arts movies, because we've had people on the show. In fact, if it, listeners may have noticed, there have been some times where I haven't asked this question because the guest has said, please don't ask this question. because <laughs> I don't want to be put on the spot because I don't really dig martial arts movies. I'm laughing because, and I say this with love, your instructor is one of the nerdiest people I know. Bar none. Yeah, and yeah. I'm surprised that he hasn't, you know, f- sat you down and forced you to watch all of them. He you know, he end definitely to end gives in me an attempt, right. attempt to to change your mind or, or or pull your belt or something. You know, I just <laughs> and he, I say that jokingly to anyone that that doesn't sure, know sure. the people that we're talking about, but it, it's just I find that comical that. He that, just, he usually just rolls his eyes and throws his hands up and like, you gotta be kidding me. How have you not seen, you know, Enter the Dragon or, or Bloodsport or any of those? I'm like, you know why? Cause I, cause I have the E network on my channel and <laughs> I, I don't know what else to tell you. I, I have no, I like, I like books. I like martial arts books. And I, um, I know you ask those questions a lot, so I do have an answer for that one, but okay. they're just not, they're not my thing. I don't know how. <laughs> and I'm unapologetic about it. I will tell you every day if you ask me, no, no, I will not be going to see movie X. I will be in the romantic comedy section. Thank you. Now, now that's you where ha- I live. You have seen Enter the Dragon, right? I have not seen it. Okay. No. You need to watch it. Karate okay. Kid, the original Karate Kid. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. I do like Karate Kid. Yeah. Uh, okay. Crouching Tiger? Never. Okay. So I'm going to ask that you go watch those two at some point because those are... Um, I would say, and, and kind of, this is kind of supported by the guests we've had on the show, probably the three most influential martial arts movies of all time. And without, probably without Enter the Dragon, I mean, we, we may be in a very different martial arts landscape than we are now. So I think for the sake of history. For the sake of history, I will do my homework. I will okay. watch it. Right, I don't nice. think I saw Karate Kid tell us about a brown belt. And then I thought, oh, this is cool. Great. But... <laughs> 
I, I own it. You know, I've, I've seen it a handful. I've seen it probably 10 times, but okay, I will watch those other ones just for you. Good. Yes, I appreciate I that. I'll, I'll, I'll check in with you soon. Make sure that you've <laughs> done your good. homework. Let's talk about books then. Okay. So talk about books, martial arts books that you've read, that you like, that you don't like, that you recommend. Let's see. Yeah, that. sure. So, um, I, uh, I, the first one I ever read was Funakoshi's autobiography, um, which is my way of life. Totally recommend it, whether you're a Shotokan practitioner or not. I've actually read that one cover to cover a handful of times. Um, it's a great book and I find that I pick something else up from that each time I read it. Mm. Um, and then there's, there's a few of the other, you know, standard classics You have the 20 guiding principles of karate, which I've read, which is great. But one that um, I also have been picking through lately, um, I read it a while ago, but again, reading it uh, one time more, is uh, it's called Shotokan Secrets. And it's great because it not only goes into the bunkai of things, but it'll explain to you the history behind the bunkai, if that makes sense. So um, it's kind of, what's this? It's called Shotokan Secret, the hidden truth behind karate's fighting origins. So it goes into the fighting part. Okay, that's part A. And then you have the history and the origin behind it. And he, and this guy has studied it for a very long time and he's a black belt and a historian. And um, it's nice to look at a kata and say, okay, why do we do that move? And then go even further and say, okay, but why use that move at all? What's the scenario behind it? Mm. And uh, he does a great job explaining it in um, very comprehensible terms about why it is in the in the in the history in Japan behind it. Um, it's really fascinating. Anybody who hasn't read it, um, it's pretty popular. I think you can probably pick it up at any any big bookstore or Amazon. But totally recommend it. And um, and it it uh, has some great photos in it um to help you out and i've learned a ton from that book and i think it's really great some of it's theory i mean who knows but uh yeah definitely recommend that one to anybody who's looking for a great read absolutely and i've read uh two of the two of those three of course we'll we'll list the titles over on the show notes for people that that are driving or otherwise don't want to jot notes while they're listening Let's talk about goals. Clearly, you're not slowing down with your training. You're you're finding opportunities to continue to train. You're still passionate about training. But why? What's keeping you going? What's keeping me going? Man, I got a laundry list of stuff, I suppose. I And I, I mentioned this sort of briefly earlier, but I have really found um, what I'm even more passionate about, like the little micro aspects of martial arts. And even just within the past few years, I think since I've probably gone off to college and, and graduated since then, but, um, I really love teaching and what I've been able to do for the, I would say even the past year or so is really figure out how to develop myself as an instructor. Um, very obvious statement here, but there's a big difference between somebody who knows martial arts and somebody who's able to teach martial arts. There is a just other worlds apart. Right. So I've been figuring out how to work with students of all different kinds and ages and ranks and figure out how I am as an instructor and how do I want to teach. And it's not as easy as it sounds. Um, you know, I went from teaching all summer in Maine for Sheehan Andy, but these are people that I kind of grew up with. So that's very easy. And then I come to teach them. I'm helping out the Shotokan club over at Harvard and we have eight different first languages spoken in our amongst all the students and that makes things really different really different uh, especially coming from you know the the suburban small town in Maine that I come from smallish where that's never a case at all so um you learn how to develop yourself as an instructor and that's really been keeping me going um I've also really kind of gone a little more traditional than I've ever gone lately because I like I dabbled in the creative stuff um kind of through my my preteen and teen years but i've really kind of gone mostly traditional at this point and um i did my first nkf tournament which is the national um karate federation um which was fascinating and just the talent is unbelievable so um you know to to do a new circuit where you see talent that just blows your mind um is extremely motivating and it just makes you want to learn more and work harder and um develop yourself as a competitor and as a black belt and um 
I, I would say that's been a huge motivator lately. Um, it's kind of put a new face on competition for me. So I'm really looking forward to, um, to tackling that in the near future. And then down the road, a little later on, like let's say late twenties, I, uh, I mean, I'm all in for opening up a dojo of my own. Um, I've, I've talked extensively to, to Shihan Andy about it. Um, and a little bit to Shihan Mello as well. And his instructors just to kind of get their feedback on, you know, the best way to go about that. Um, and I, you know, I'd love to have students on a competition team and make that my, uh, my livelihood for until I can't walk anymore. And I'm elderly. That's my goal. It's my plan. It's a great plan. <laughs> I like it. I like it a lot. So if anybody wants to get a hold of you or, you know, maybe they're, they're a Harvard student, they want to find out information about the club or, you know, something, how can people find out more about you, get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can definitely um, feel free to uh, shoot me a message on Facebook. I know I have the most generic name in the entire world, but I promise you can find me on there. Uh, just Katie Jordan. And um, if you Google uh, Harvard Shotokan Karate, um, there should be an, uh, an email address within there. And there's also a Facebook group that you can take a look at um, that, that has all our, our updates and stuff in there. So feel free to do that. And um, yeah, and I'm always I'm always around the tournament circuit for a pwn and I hit up a couple other tournaments from other circuits during the year. So I always love talking to people. So come on up. Have a chat. Awesome. We'll link all that stuff again in the show notes. But before we go, any parting advice for everyone listening? Sure, yeah. Um I actually kind of thought about this question quite a bit. And I had a great conversation with um with Sensei Rich Borges a few a few weeks ago. And it was really just about um, and this kind of goes m- m- to black belts more than anyone, but take your martial arts into your own hands at a certain point. And that doesn't mean le- leaving a dojo or leaving an instructor or anything like that. That's absolutely not what I'm saying. Um, what it, what I mean is just being able to stop only learning because your instructor tells you what to do. Okay. You, I, be a sponge. Absolutely. And you still need to train, but I think there's something to be said for creating your own quote unquote, martial arts IQ. Um, you know, I don't see it really any different than if a person goes to get a medical degree, um, you know, once they graduate and they get their MD, they're going to continue learning and researching and, and practicing and reading and all that kind of stuff. And they still have their teachers and their mentors and, and advisors as we still have our instructors. But I think there comes a time where when you're of a certain rank and experience, you need to be able to figure things out for yourself and you need to not be, not only be able to solve your own problems that you're going to do, but figure out how to kind of diagnose them. Um, I don't know if that totally makes sense, but, um, you know, you have a, you have a brain. So after a long time of training and, and working under your instructor and at your dojo, stay there and continue to do so, but use your brain, figure things out on your own, find out what works, pass on knowledge. Um, and, uh, be able to look at, at martial arts intellectually as opposed to just being, you know, nodding your head and, and being a yes man. Um, and uh, I think that that's just going to make you um, a better martial artist. And that's where you start to, to really find a newfound passion for it once you become a, you know, maybe a need on or a or whenever it comes for you. But, um, you know, it's a lifelong journey. And if you, stop trying to learn, you're going to get bored and you're not going to enjoy it anymore. But if you continue to teach yourself and to teach others and to seek out knowledge from, from really experienced, wonderfully talented people, I, th- I think it's going to put a whole new face on martial arts for you. And, and it, people will be really surprised. I have been very pleasantly. Um, so I encourage everyone to do that. And uh, more than anything, have fun when you're doing it. If you're not having fun, I don't really know what you're doing. You know, <laughs> have a smile on your face when you leave the dojo. Have a good time. Make friends with people. You know, be kind to people. Have fun. Enjoy the being at the dojo and help others enjoy it too. It's clear that Sensei Jordan has a long martial arts life ahead of her. I have no doubt that if she wants her own dojo someday, she'll have it as well as any other goal that she's striving for. Thank you, Sensei Jordan, for coming on the show. Over at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, you can find the show notes, including links and titles of everything that we discussed today. There's also a place to sign up for the newsletter. You can follow Whistlekick on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. If you want to know what's going on behind the scenes of the show, please check out the Facebook group, 
Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, behind the scenes. We're always open to new guests for the show, so if you want to throw your hat in the ring, or you have a recommendation for someone else that would be a great guest, get on over to the website and fill out the form there. There's also a form for just general feedback. We'd love to hear about that. If email's easier for you, info at whistlekick.com will get to us as well. If you like the show, please be sure you're subscribing, and that way you're never going to miss an episode. You know, we're always asking for those reviews, so whatever works for you, iTunes, Stitcher, there's a ton of places to leave them. iTunes works the best for us, and even if you're not an Apple user, you can still leave us one over there. It takes a little bit of work, but we'd really appreciate it. Remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com, and remember, every one of them ships for free every day. If you're a school owner or a team coach, you've got wholesale.whistlekick.com to save some money and help your team and your students out. Until next time, train hard, smile, have a great day.